Presentation. I'm Matt Hartless, I'm a musician and journalist. And I'm AJ Hill, I'm a comedian and idiot. And let us wish you a very happy Easter, because this is going out on Easter Sunday. I realise probably most of our listeners at best are apathetic towards Christianity. Probably we haven't got many, many actual Christians who would be celebrating Easter listening to us, but uh, if you do celebrate it, then have a nice weekend. I mean, to be honest, the only, the only reason I really know that Easter's ever coming round is because I think on a Friday, I'll go to the shop and n- nothing's open. And I think, oh, I'll have to go on Monday then. And then it's not open on Monday either. Either, either that or it's the long weekend you get off off work, which is pretty <laughs> good. But uh, yeah, if... Happy rebirth. Yeah. Hey, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And, and possibly happy rebirth to our pubs. They might be open at Easter weekend. So if they are... Uh, we're recording this in February, by the way. But if uh, if our pubs are open, you can bet your bottom dollar that AJ and I will be frequenting them. What did you uh, What did you give up for Lent? Uh, I, I haven't given up anything for Lent. You've not given up anything. Well, no. I give... never do. I, I I never do because I never stick to it. I've given up drinking during the week. Oh, okay. Because I, I bought a PS4 on uh, Pancake Day after drinking eight beers. Ah. And, and sticking some, I didn't stick some pancakes to the ceiling. That was a, a lie. I, uh, I'm very good at pancake flipping. Believe it or not, I'm very, not very dexterous, but for some reason, pancake flipping, I got that down pat. So there we go. There's a factoid about me <laughs> to start the podcast. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, uh, well, that's great. Well, good, good luck with that. I suppose not not drinking during the week is a lot more achievable than I guess most people's Lent kind of ideas. Because most people go for, I'm going to give up drinking. Or I'm going to give up eating chocolates or whatever, which is, you know, it's very difficult to do. But I suppose if it's just like, I'm not going to drink during the week, then you can just go, do I need this now? Or shall I just leave it to the weekend? And I suppose that's probably a much easier thing to get through. Well, Christian, most Christians traditionally give up meat during the week, but they always, they, they eat at the weekend. I mean, it's, oh, it's, right. a, it's okay. a time of fasting, isn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, fasting is what you're supposed to do, but you're not meant to completely punish yourself. It's just a time of reflection and trying to sort out your life. So... Yeah. To any of those out there who did give up stuff, um, I hope you made it, uh, and I hope I yeah. do as well. Oh, blimey, yeah, yeah. I, I realised why you were talking about that now. Right, yes, of course. Yes, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you, whatever you gave up, I have loads of it now. You don't, you, Lent, Lent is over, it is Easter weekend. Although actually it's over the week before, isn't it? Because that's Palm Sunday when he, when he gets to Jerusalem. No, no, no. That's the end so, of Lent, um, isn't it? Because that's after he comes out of the, his exile in the desert. No, no. Palm Sunday is before. It's it's the last weekend of of Lent. Palm Sunday. Yeah. So Lent Lent ends on Palm Sunday. No. No. Lent ends on Easter. So. Oh right. Okay. Quick factoid that. about that. So Palm Sunday is when Jesus entered Jerusalem. To yeah. Ba- and he basically the palms got laid because he was seen as the king, and people saw him as the Messiah, which was a big no no. Right. And uh, very then naughty he had boy. The, yeah, yeah. Then he had the Last Supper, and Good Friday was when he was. Done in, yeah. And then, so Friday, you're all sad and you eat fish. Saturday is like a Tuesday, is like a religious Tuesday, you know, where it's just a nothing day. There's not a lot going okay, on. You're like, right, why are we yeah. here? And then Sunday is the let's eat all the Easter eggs as as you're doing now, because obviously yeah. our listeners are munching on eggs. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. Enjoy, enjoy your enjoy those eggs. chocolate folks. It's the best, but yeah, best but, thing about about Easter, isn't it? So people so. like candles as well. I could never really understand the candles, but there's candles involved. You light a candle every every Sunday. Yeah, I'm I'm not a a Christian and did not really have even even though you know even though I was born Church of England, I did not really have much of a a religious upbringing at all. So yeah, I know the bare bones of it, and that's that's it. So well, yeah, I, I am a I was born a Christian, and I am technically an ordained minister who can oh yeah preside over weddings in California. So there we go. Excellent. Well, uh, here's here's a thought. If you'd uh, if you'd like to request AJ um, performing your your wedding, uh, then you can support us on buymeacoffee.com slash y zero y m c r. Maybe that is something that if you give us <laughs> enough money by subscribing, uh, AJ will do for you. Um, especially if you fly him out to California, all uh, all yep. expenses paid. 
I'll come as well. I, I can't do anything, but uh, I'll, I'll play some music for you if you do that. That's what we'll do. There um, we you could also find us on social media uh, if you look for YOY Podcast. So, it's twofer. So, you get, get the music and the ministry yeah. involved in one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get get the lot. So, have you got a Hammond organ? That's the question. I I don't have a Hammond organ, but there's a Hammond organ setting on my stage piano, which is right behind me as we record this. There we go, then. So, so sorted. Yeah. Right. So uh, today we are going to go way, way back in time. I imagine this will be the earliest period of history that we cover on this show. Long before Jesus. Long, long, long before Jesus. So let's go through some time scales. So as we talked about in the Fermi Paradox episode, modern humans evolved about 50,000 years ago. That's about the point at which you'd be able to go, this is a human as we would understand one today, rather than it being... We're not much changes, so we're basically yeah. anatomically the same, yeah. intellectually the same, things like that. Yeah, quite, okay. yeah. Yeah, so I, th- I think the idea is that like, if, if you were a time traveller, you could go back about 50,000 years, take a, a baby human from that period, bring it to the present day, and raise it as a modern-day human, and it would be fine. Mm-hmm. Whereas anything older than that, it, it wouldn't... Uh, quite be. Yeah, yeah. So was it just like one year? Yeah. One, one year, year, eight man, yeah. the next year, poof, human Well, being. quite. And, and and I think evolutionary biologists will probably be quite annoyed at that because that is very much not how it goes. It's, you know, each sort of little frame along the, you know, each, each generation along the way is not significantly different to the last one. But okay. yeah, around 50,000 years ago, that's when modern humans started to appear. Around seven to 10,000 years ago, this is when uh, agriculture began to be, developed now the reason for the the difference in time is that it didn't happen everywhere at the same time Mm -hmm. like you know some humans in some places uh got the idea to start farming rather than just living off what they could hunt or gather okay kind of around the same time that societies and civilizations are being developed because the production of food is then being taken care of by a small group of people rather than everyone sort of trying to get what they need okay so then you know the labor can then be focused on on other areas so the the reason we know that is from various archaeological finds that are dated back to that period um the earliest coherent recorded history comes from 2000 around 2600 bc which is just over four and a half thousand years ago and this was the the sumerians which is uh in, in modern day iraq and now shortly after that um between two 1500 and 2400 bc mm-hmm. is when the pyramids were constructed and also stonehenge so yes both were made at around the same time uh, the reign of cleopatra uh, was 51 bc to 30 bc so that's uh, just just over 2000 years ago fun fact i uh, i read a tweet literally yesterday yeah it was a tweet by a, a man who said that um his egyptian wife had never heard of stonehenge so like uh he showed her a picture and she was just like, your ancestors were pathetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was very much thinking that, yeah, it's like Stonehenge and the pyramids, like the pyramids, this absolute thing of wonder, huge structures that have survived to this day. Stonehenge is just a, a few rocks, some of which have fallen over. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's an impressive feature, but yes, yeah, quite, uh, in yeah. comparison to, um, the, King's to the pyramids Chamber and all those things. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. But uh, yeah, so the, the Great Pyramids in Egypt are as ancient to, Cle- to Cleopatra as she is to us. Wow. So that's so. What one of the problems of talking about ancient history is that it's very difficult to get across how long ago it was, because it's just you, you know we I, I think humans we have this idea of like you know before a few hundred years ago that's kind of the analogous same kind of period of history. Well, when um, I was a kid, I used to believe that like they invented um, color in like the nineteen sixties. So <laughs> well, because everything I, I, yeah, because, back and so mind, I, yeah. I thought as a child, I genuinely believed that everything pre nineteen sixty was like in black and white, <laughs> and at some point they just invented color. So yeah, so the reason I've talked about all those sort of like those markers of when these things happened is because Gede- oh, fucking hell. There we go. Straight <laughs> in. Got your back. I said, yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, <laughs> I said this would be the episode where I struggled to pronounce things, uh, and I've all, all, already screwed up pronouncing yeah. the name of the thing we're talking about. Gebekli Tepe, which is the what we're talking about today. This was constructed around nine thousand BC. So that's nine thousand. Is it nine thousand BC? I've, I've got, I've got thirteen thousand BC. 
Really? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I looked at a number of different sources, mm-hmm. and it seemed to place it around 11,000 years ago. Okay, I've got 15,000 years ago. Right, okay. Well, that's that's interesting. Well, we can talk about that then. Okay. Uh, a bit later. I mean, the thing with saying... Actually, actually, there. That, that is a good point. Something that I have somewhere later on in my notes. Uh, I think it's when we're talking about the carvings of what's on the stones. Mm-hmm. It does point to a historical event that was way before 9000 BC. So that might be actually one of the things. But the, the reason it was dated to 9000 BC was because... Of, I think there were various artifacts found around that suge- that were carb- that had been radiocarbon dated um, that were from that time, mm-hmm. and I think the the limited amount of radiocarbon dating on the the actual structures at Gebekli Tepe suggests the same thing. But of course, that's you know I how mean, how, all, how reliable is yeah, that? It's, it's, all it's an just an estimation. It's all yeah, approximate. Yeah. So I have heard between eleven thousand fifteen thousand sort of like years yeah. old, but it's a, it's a long yeah. A fuck of a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this was more ancient to the builders of the pyramids mm-hmm. than they are to us. Yes. So, yeah, they they were ancient to Cleopatra, um, the the pyramid constructors. That is, uh, that's why I was using that as an example of how long ago that was. Mm-hmm. It's even longer ago from them to the construction of Gebekli Tepe. So this is really, really old. This site. <laughs> so it's it's six to seven millennia older than the earliest recorded history. And it's at least one millennium older than the earliest evidence of organised agriculture. So it, it's older than the domestication of cats. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the domestication of the cats kind of happened around the time that there were buildings because weren't the cats to, to catch pests? That's well, what I thought. But why it, cats were domesticated was because they. Well, yeah, but like so technically, that was before the domestication of of animals, really. So ca- yeah. cats were one of the first animals to be domesticated because they found it more useful to sort of be around. I mean, you can see, to be honest, we've kind of got that thing going on with foxes. Now foxes are mm. semi-domesticated because they are used to being around humans. Probably, yeah, an animal yeah. that's probably not fully going to be domesticated, but I assume that the way urban foxes behave is probably very similar to how cats used to behave. Yeah. But obviously cats had a bit more of a, a useful function because they caught more mice and things like that. So. Mm, precisely, yeah. So anyway, because, because this is before agriculture organized agriculture mm-hmm. it means that um that, that this this place Quebecli Tepe this was built by uh hunter gatherers mm-hmm. acting as a civilization which before the discovery of this site was that uh, it, it was thought that civilization came came way after mm-hmm. um this period when was the site discovered so the, the site was discovered in 1990 well i mean it, so, so, so this is the thing. It, it was it was known about for quite a while, but wasn't thought important. Um, it was discovered in 1995. The like the the structures and how old it was mm-hmm. was that was when that was found out. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was just about to move so, so on to the fine, location, that, uh, and you wanted to, to mention. Yeah, the location. So yes, so we're we're talking about the domestication of yes. certain things. So go Beckley Tepe is older than the domestication of the wild almond. Yeah. And the wild almond is one of my favourite facts of, of human ingenuity. So wild almonds are toxic to human consumption. They have arsenic in them, and they are bitter and poisonous. <laughs> yeah. And humans, hunter-gatherers, managed to figure out that um, there are two genes which have the poison and the bitter taste in an almond. And if you switch those off, you get sweet almonds. So what hunter-gatherers realized, that if they bred certain plants together, you would get a sweet almond. Now, that didn't happen. I've written this down. There we go. That literally didn't happen until... Uh, yeah, so it's about... three. I think it's like 3,000... Yeah, so civilization of the, was like, yeah, 3,000 BC. Um, we've got, like, cultivation of almonds as a crop. But... Um, we started to actually hunter gatherers humans started to do that about 12,000 BC. So if this site, so it's around the same time that we started doing that. Mm. So like they weren't actually a crop at that point. It was just people started eating things and going, that doesn't make me feel as sick as this other one. So I'll eat that fun fact. I think there are eight genes in a, an, an oak tree, uh, which means that we can't have a sweet acorn. So unfortunately our hunter gatherer, they couldn't figure out. And also they couldn't figure out how to make a sweet acorn because also the length of time it takes for a, an oak tree to grow. Oh, well, yeah. So we couldn't switch off those eight genes, but two genes for a hunter-gatherer selective breeding was something. Genetic engineering, 
something that our uh, hunter gatherer predecessors mm. could. Yeah, yeah. So and, um, yeah. so all those people who were like, no, we'll have no GMOs in our food, please. Like it's yeah, <laughs> basically the the reason we can eat anything at all <laughs> is, is yeah. because of uh, genetic and uh, g- uh, genetic modification. Our ancestors figured out. Um, our ancestors figured out which almonds to eat, and uh, the people who haven't got descendants, <laughs> the people who aren't our ancestors, did not figure that out and died. So there you go. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But it's to show. I just wanted to point that out because it shows that they were quite intelligent. Humans have yes. always been quite intelligent, and also that discovery was found in the African plains because what, what, do, what was going on there? Where was Gobekli Tepe? Centered. So it's centered in the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent. Yeah, which is a name given to a region of, I've written out the countries that, that it includes. So it's, uh, it covers areas of Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Syria, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Cyprus. Which I heard, I heard this is, this is a wonderful analogy. So obviously, if you've listened to previous podcasts, we talked about the uh, the Great Filter and, and yes. the uh, Fermi Paradox. So it's... It, the Earth is in what is known as the Goldilocks zone, and so most solar systems have a Goldilocks zone. Now, on the globe at the time, the Fertile Crescent was basically the Goldilocks zone, zone of, the of the Earth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the and the reason for that is because the like this was around the time Gobekli Tepe was built. This is around the end of the last ice age, so mm-hmm. the Earth was colder, the weather was more extreme, and there was more flooding. So you think of all the flood myths in okay. like, in, in religions. Yep. Um, there would have been a lot of flooding in in early well in in this period of human history lots because of ice sheets. yeah because mm-hmm. lots of ice sheets were melting, um, but but because of this um, this made the the soil richer and uh, and more irrigated, mm-hmm. so yeah things grew very easily in the fertile crescent. So basically, like you didn't even really need agriculture in the fertile crescent because things grew so plentifully okay. there that it was very easy to live off that land. So it was... I mean, y- you think about this area now, it's mostly desert, but at the time it was... The birthplace of agriculture. Mm, well, yeah, well, it's, it's called, also called the cradle of civilization. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Gebekli Tepe itself, it's about 15 kilometres east of the Turkish city of Sandy Urfa, or also just called Urfa. Are they different? Is yeah. that where all the flat earthers come from? <laughs> boop, boop, boop. <laughs> it's not. Uh, yeah. I'm so not a flat earther. That's I'm in, a lumpy earth. That's that's <laughs> in that's in Kurdish Turkey. It's about 350 kilometers west of of Sumeria, mm-hmm. uh, so Iraq. So yeah, it's in it's in Kurdish Turkey. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Kurdistan includes parts of southeast Turkey, northeast Syria, north Iraq, and northwest Iran. Uh, and these people don't consider themselves Turkish, Arabic, or or, or Persian. Mm-hmm. They mostly practice uh, Sunni Islam, which you know, if you've heard any, anything about all the the conflicts going on in the Middle East over the last twenty years, yep. you will know that you know the the flavor of Islam that you that you believe in is is can be can be quite important. And they all drink Sunni D. Uh, uh, well, they they might do. I mean, they definitely don't drink alcohol. Apparently, yeah. it's, it's very very difficult to get alcohol out around. San Leofa, which is very good for uh, research because the researchers aren't getting distracted by um, mm. well, vices. Quite. Well, I mean, th- th- this is the thing that, that a lot of the the researchers are European, mm-hmm. and so you know this this itself has created a bit of a problem with uh, the locals because they come in and they 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 bring beer and, and alcohol with them, and you know set up a market for that, which a lot of the local Kurdish population are really unhappy with. Mm-hmm. Also, they're also not happy about um, being controlled by the Turkish government because they feel as though they are a different people group and want to be independent. I mean, a lot of Turkish people aren't really happy about being controlled by the Turkish government. But... Well, yeah, <laughs> at, at the moment, yeah. But so, yeah, there's there's also a significant number of the Kurdish population who, um, who follow a religion called Yazidism, Okay. Um, what is that? I've never heard CDs. of EDs. And... Uh, well, we'll we'll come back to that later. Okay. So stick a pin in that. That that becomes important probably <laughs> about an hour later if you're listening to this. Fantastic. Um, I, I love your. That's now but, your new uh, catchphrase. By that, we'll come back. Yeah, to that later. We'll, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> Just to know that there are you know part of the people. Uh, the, the reason I'm not discussing this later on is because I don't want it to come it, come out of nowhere. But this is about a. This only really has relevance to a fictional book that I'm going to talk about at at the end. Okay. But. Yazidism is important to the plot of that fictional book, right. but I just wanted to say that there are it, it is a real religion, and there are people who practice it living in this area of Turkey. So yeah, so the 
the first the, the yeah sorry the fertile crescent we mentioned before it was yep. the term was coined by U.S. archaeologist James Henry Breasted. Um, <laughs> He's called Breasted. I have, I have, yeah, I have, I have exactly yeah. I have, I have no other use for that information. I just thought it'd be quite funny to say yeah, Breasted. Yeah, Doctor F- Doctor Breasted. Yeah, <laughs> Doctor Breasted. Yeah. But, interesting um, fertility how, yeah, how so it, it, it contained unusually fertile soil and productive fresh water for mm-hmm. uh, the time so it's the the perfect conditions to grow crops staples grains and cereal so from the 1950s irrigation projects have diverted a lot of water from the tigris euphrates system mm-hmm. which is why it's much more de- um, desertified Arid. now yeah it's a shame uh, but I, but this was like the, it was already less fertile than it than it had been before then. But it was kind of from barren, but potentially usable to being yeah desert now because of because of irrigation projects that so have sent water elsewhere. What you're saying is that we've we've destroyed the Garden of Eden. We've literally destroyed the, what is well, widely regarded as the Garden of Eden. So, well, so. It, well, that that is very much a, a a plot point that will come along. So, um, we'll so what is, we've, we've mentioned Gebekli Tepe quite a bit without saying what it actually is. Okay. So, uh, as I said before, it was discovered in 1995 okay. uh, to be this ancient archaeological site. So, mm-hmm. uh, Klaus Schmidt, a German archaeologist, uh, made the uh, discovery of the site, well, he visited the site in 1994, mm-hmm. looked at it and thought, this... This is an interesting place. I want to, I, I want to do a dig here, uh, and in 1995 was able to start doing that, and then discovered uh, megaliths, which are large stone pillars and tools. What does Gobekli Tepe mean? Gobekli Tepe means belly hill. So my lockdown nickname. <laughs> <laughs> it means belly hill in Turkish. I mean, this is th- th- this was why um, classmate wanted to. to uh, excavate it because it was it was thought that it was just a hill and maybe it was you know a, a medieval graveyard or it'd be, something it'd been found in he, 1963 hadn't it i think yes yeah. yeah yeah so um so klaus schmidt looked at this and thought that hill is artificial okay that's not a naturally forming hill, which everyone previously had thought it's just oh it's just a hill that had a graveyard on top of it mm-hmm. probably and not really bothered with it so yeah so the the megaliths these huge stone pillars okay uh, which are mostly in t shapes which is interesting look, look quite quite weird um, but yeah, they, they were discovered along with tools that were contemporaneous with 9000 BC, which was why Klaus Schmidt thought that that was around the time it was constructed. Lots of flint objects then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so, yeah, it, th- this was the Stone Age. It was in the Upper Paleolithic period, which is kind of the end of the early Stone Age. Now, the, the early Stone Age is basically from when people started using stone as tools. So this is from 3.4 million years ago to about four and a half thousand years ago okay so yeah the the upper paleolithic period was until about ten thousand years ago Mm -hmm. and that's when people are starting to get more complex tools and stuff out of stone rather than just using rocks to do things yeah this is yeah it's quite a malleable yes exactly yeah so they're making hammers and sort of like stone blades as well that could use as chisels Mm -hmm. um so yeah that's that was why um, Klaus Schmidt thought that that was the the correct timing for that, and yeah, he calm and dated some things that were found at the site and came to the the same conclusion with that. Excellent. Uh, so yeah, these are arranged in a, a circular formation. A lot of these stones, uh, similar to Stonehenge. So you think about the sort of stone so circle. A henge circle. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but um, but it's uh, it's far more complex. Uh, and obviously much older, as we said before. But um, you can see there's like there's a lot of different layers and a lot of different kind of like rooms, antechambers, things mm-hmm. like that, uh, in different kind of places along this 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 complex um, right. on 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 Belly Hill, on Gebekli Tepe. Before uh, when when I was researching this, I reached out to and this is a YOY first. I reached out to an expert. Wow. Uh, because my my cousin. Um, has a first class honours degree in Egyptology from the University of Liverpool. Okay. Uh, so she was, I mean, obviously that's way after um, Gebekli Tepe, so she wasn't able to tell me about that, but she was able to tell me a bit about excavations and, and how, how they're done. And um, so she said that um, excavations happen in seasons of a couple of months at a time. Okay. So to, obviously in this area of the world, it's too hot in the summer and it gets too wet in the in the winter mm-hmm. um so you know so 
people don't die trying to excavate them and also that the stuff that is excavated isn't ruined by adverse weather conditions. That's that's why the seasons are a couple of months. Okay. Uh, so excavations of, of big sites like Gobekli Tepe can take years, decades as a result of this. Um, what people usually do is they'll start by digging test pits. Uh, and so, you know, you dig down a bit where you think there might be something, see if there's anything there. If you come up with interesting artifacts, then you'll do a bigger excavation of the area. If you come up with nothing, When does the little brush come into it? The little badger brushes. Uh, well, I mean, at that point, you don't you don't just go in gung ho, just go hey dynamite, Woo! digger. Yeah, that's the kind of uh, yeah. come on, that's what time team should do. Just go in with like yeah. a digger and just, yeah. just get this site dug up. So I mean, like there's maps and geological surveys, and more recently satellite imaging okay. can point to areas of interest. So people already have in this day and age, have a good idea of what kind of depth they expect to find things at. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they'll, to get down to that depth, obviously they'll use the bigger tools and then it's the, yeah, your trowels and your brushes will come out at, okay. at that stage when you when you think you're close. Um, so, yeah, it's, a lot of it's very hit and miss with, with excavating. Because, like battleships? No. Um, <laughs> A lot of um, excavating is, is is hit and miss because though things can point you to an area, you don't actually know if anything's there. But you know, you can you can have a fairly educated guess. But surely Gwe- Gebekli Tepe was pretty good because when what's his name, Kurt Schmidt, Klaus Schmidt, Klaus, Klaus, sorry, Klaus. When Klaus Schmidt got there, apparently he just found loads of stone tools just from being there. So he's like, well, this is an unusual place. So. Mm. Yeah, so it was, a, it was a fertile part of the fertile present for archaeology. <laughs> well, yeah, indeed, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think this is the thing. It's just, but it is, it is that kind of happy accident that mm-hmm. he he looked at this hill and thought that looks artificial in construction. I'd like to excavate that. And it's then, a pot you belly, know, so they poured alcohol onto the earth. <laughs> <and that's what> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I suppose the thing was that when he was excavating it, I don't know if he really thought that he was going to find something that's almost impossibly old, like one of the most endearing mysteries of archaeology. Well, when you think about it, like the actual a potbelly shape is quite an unusual shape anyway, when you think about it. Like it's not mm. like normal mounds are just mounds, aren't they? But like if you've got something that's like sort of curved at one side and then like that. Yeah, or yeah. Or like a fella on his back uh, looking up at the night sky. Why Klaus Schmidt? noticed this and others didn't because it was like you say it was actually examined uh, and dismissed in the 1960s Mm -hmm. by the university of chicago and istanbul university as a medieval graveyard one of the one of the reasons for this is that the the limestone on the top layer had been plowed over by unsuspecting farmers not knowing what was down there and so it was it it had got damaged and scarred and so they just looked at this and thought oh it's just bunch of rocks it's not 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 very good so i mean you know it's just i a, guess it's just is I that how that's like, it's just a bunch of you know, rocks it's not guess, very good <laughs> <laughs> well i guess that's like it was it decca records turning down the beetles i suppose that's what these excavation grooves probably felt like after it was discovered because it's yeah um such a significant archaeological find yeah and they actually went there and looked at it and just thought nah nah, nah it's nothing so one of the interesting things about Gobekli Tepe is that there are no telltale signs of settlement within it. So it, it wasn't built as a house. Well, it's, it's, it's five structure. kilometers away from a water source, isn't it? As far as I'm, aw- as far as yes. I'm aware. So yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's the, the reason they, they think there wasn't a settlement is that they can't find any hearths or, or what would they, they would consider to be uh, houses or, or, or trash pits, um, which is, you know, discarded. Well, landfill sites, you, yeah. tiny landfill sites. Yeah, essentially, yeah. So here we go. In the next of how do you pronounce this? It's uh, Joris Joris Peters, Joris who is Peters. A, a a Belgian archaeologist. And so they 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 found loads of animal bones around the site. Okay. Um, with cuts, uh, which suggested they were they were butchered and 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 cooked. And this is the, the telltale signs of uh, of a hunter gatherer society. Um, and it's all wild game as well. These weren't domesticated animals, but they found animal bones with cuts on them. So they were animals that were caught, killed and eaten by by humans. Again, leading to the idea that ha- of how old Gebekli Tepe is, which is uh, was until its discovery was thought to be impossible. There but, are still game reserves in Africa to this day. Yes, I'm, I'm sure there are. But what you're saying is, is that they've... 
I mean, I, I, I think, well, I mean, you know, we don't know that much about Gebek Lutepe. Maybe that will turn out to be the case. It's just in the middle of this massive game reserve that have been, that have been created by farmers, by ancient farmers who, uh, who were very good at disguising how old they were. Solve the case. Anyway, that's been one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so there is evidence of primitive farming okay. uh, within 500 years of Gebek Lutepe's construction. Right. So... Gebekli Tepe could be the start of agriculture that might, whatever it is, could signify the beginning of essentially moving out of the stone. So Gebekli Tepe could be the the area where actual farming started at, around the same time. Is that what you're saying? Yes. It, okay. It could be. There are other contemporaneous to what Klaus Schmidt thought was the the age of Gebekli Tepe. There are other early hunter gatherer villages that that surround. Uh, Gebekli Tepe, and uh, I'm going to try and pronounce those now. Excellent. They, they've all got names in Turkish. Uh, so there's Kay- Kayanu. Kayanu! <laughs> Is that not a Scottish one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> the next one sounds a bit Scottish as well. I think I must have written this down wrong because it looks like I've written Murray Bet. Murray Bet. Murray. Murray uh, just, uh, it's where a, you're going to drink. Bookies. Bookie, yeah, 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 Bookie Fast. <laughs> Some book down here. Yeah, hunt gatherer bookies. Um, Alan, do you reckon it'll take to finish that thing? Uh, Five hundred years. <laughs> um, and there's there's Jeff Jeff El Ahmar is another one. So there we go. That's my turn at mispronouncing things. Excellent. If so, you know how to pronounce them, by the way, have we got an email address? Yes, yes. It's it's y o y o y o y at gmail dot com. Yeah, so email us on that. Yeah. I think, I think if you go to our Facebook, you can find the actual email address because it's I can't be bothered spelling it out because it's 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 long. Basically, I, I wanted yoy at gmail dot com, but that was already taken. Okay, so we've got more we've got more yeah. things to make it a bit harder. But if if you if you know what's going on with the pronunciation of anything yeah. in in this show, if we get it wrong, just let us know because yeah. that'll be fun, and then yeah, we can yeah. just list our errors and mistakes. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we can learn how to pronounce things in the future. Exactly. For future episodes. This which, is which this is all about know. learning, folks. So the the megaliths, the megaliths have a lot of carvings okay. on them, uh, like you would find cave drawings uh, from a contem- contemporaneous period. Okay, uh, carvings depicting various things. Uh, so there's Daniel Stordeur, who is a French archaeologist, right? Um, and she says, "Does she have that, a whip?" Um, she have a whip. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, I was going to say no, but then I I actually don't know. She might do. But she says ancient civilizations believed um, vultures carried the dead to heaven because they're they're high flying and they feast on on, on corpses. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was quite a common motif um, in in ancient carvings, paintings, etc. And and Gebekli Tepe has a lot of carvings of vultures. So okay. she thinks that, that the site has something to do with with death and the afterlife as a result. Well, um, as as far as I'm aware, there's like all nearly all the carvings in Gobekli Tepe are all dangerous animals, like pretty much all dangerous animals. Yeah, there's like scorpions and, scorpions and spiders. And spiders yeah. and crocodiles. Yeah. Uh-huh. And there's very few things like ducks. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Although ducks can be dangerous too, folks, because they're, they're after your bread. <laughs> yeah. They're also, uh, one of the more kind of like macabre things found is that there were there were human skulls that were with, with carvings on them. Mm-hmm. And, and and they were tested and found to have residues of red ochre pigment, which um, red ochre is an early uh, colour that was used, uh, th- that was made, rather. So uh, these these skulls were, were decorative, but they're human skulls. Human skulls, yeah. They've been carved and painted, basically. Is, is that, a, a, I assume that's a religious thing? Well, it, again, suggesting that it has something to do with worshipping of, of death or the afterlife. There's a lot of there's a lot of there was a lot of uh, there are there are quite a few carvings that show yeah. decapitations as well. Well, there's pillars with that as well. Mm. So it's a theme that some of the pillars of like the pillar men they're, yeah. they're headless. That's what I wrote. So they think that yeah. they think that it might have been a skull worshiping thing because apparently in Turkey at the time, well not at the time, but in Turkey, a theme throughout history has been skull worshiping. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean that that would very much marry up with what's been what's been found. So there's the. Uh, the gift bearer, which is one of the one of the stones. I don't know what the gift bearer is. Please, it's it's it's, it's just it's a it's a the name given to a depiction on, on one of the stones. Okay. Is um, it a headless person offering something? Uh, well, it's it's some sort of being uh, offering a head. Oh, um, okay. so it's some sort of being that looks like a bird that's Part- kind of holding holding a head. Party food. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, Monkey so, brains. Or if we're going along the archaeology route. And why yeah. did Steven Spielberg and George Lucas lie to us about what archaeology actually was? <laughs> it's just well, like eating monkey brains and grave robbing. That's what <laughs> that's what Indy does. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think yeah. The not actual, a badger brush. Actual, actual archaeology is is not not quite as dramatic as no. uh, as Indiana Jones, unfortunately. And yeah, though though archaeology is exciting and interesting in its own right. Well, pretty um, shocking when you find something as old as. Quebec Tepe. Tepe, yeah, yeah. It's not Pop the kind of thing that Hill. translates well into sitting in a in a, in a theatre and watching a film. Big at Hill, the dawn of civilization. <laughs> mm. Fascinating. Well, I mean, you say that, but obviously, again, beer was was uh, in fact alcohol was very important in in early history before they knew how to uh, uh, distill water everywhere, but. Because Asia. Water, a lot of water was yeah, was, um, yeah had, had disease in it. So yeah, and, and in Asia it was tea. Yeah, it, 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 but it's so much more logical to boil water to cleanse it than to ferment. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get tiny organisms to make this alcoholic, and then we can drink it. Mm. <laughs> what? How did I, I? Yeah, we need to do something on why. Just I want to explain alcohol to the, the okay. world. Uh, well, to, yeah, that that'd be a good, good because fun, it's, fun episode. It's, it's insane. It's insane that somebody was just like, yeah, fermented alcohol isn't no. poisonous. Well, I mean, you know, I, I th- there there are so many things where I think, how on earth was that discovered? Like cheese, for example. Like who on earth who on earth discovered Saw like some good blue stuff on an animal yeah, and went, yeah, yeah, I'll eat that. Yeah, well, I mean, like <laughs> milk from a cow in the first place. Thinking that looks like that'd be good to drink. And then, yeah, getting that and letting it go off a bit, and I mean, then going, that looks good to eat. Now. Yeah, I think I think milk. I think milk's not such a stretch because obviously humans have always had breast milk. So I think yeah. obviously some got somebody's just gone. They've got tits as well. Yeah, let's let's get the stuff out of their tits and like you know we can just drink that. It <laughs> seems quite nutritious. That's true. That's true. Um, so yeah, one of the one of, one of the interesting carvings. Uh, well, I mean they're all interesting, but one of the most interesting carvings at Gobekli Tepe uh, is depicting a comet impact, which happened in around eleven thousand BC. Supposedly, that's the, Supposedly. it's in Greenland, isn't it? So there was there was a thought that there was a, yeah. a comet well, I mean, that the, struck comets, the Earth. In, in... Comet, comets hit Earth like you know they're they're uh, astrolog- uh, astrological. Mm-hmm. Uh, astronomical impacts quite often. Obviously, this kind of comet impact would have been quite big. And, like, you know, would, the effects of which would have been felt over the globe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, it could have been in Greenland, but, I mean, I suppose you'd have seen it. Um, you'd have seen the comet yeah. coming in. So, the, it's, like, it's, it's one of the biggest shames ever. about modern culture in, in that we don't see the stars anymore. Light pollution is a terrible, terrible thing. You don't see... Like back in those days, you could see the Milky Way above your head. Anything well, yeah. that you could see was right there in the house we used to live in, the house of broken men. We used to, I used to live with a cosmologist called Neil, lovely man who used to drive crazy by coming in late at night after gigs. And uh, he used to go to Chile, the Chile Observatory, and he'd show me all these pictures of the stuff that he'd been looking at. And yeah. It's incredible, the stuff that you can see where there's no light pollution. But so well, back, quite, in, yeah. back in those days, humans had a much more... Even though we've now sent humans in space, they had a much more intimate relationship with the heavens than we do today, which I think is a travesty and a shame, although yeah. I do like having electricity. Yeah, it, it is an interesting thought. I mean, when I've been to uh, Cyprus, which I mentioned before, um, because my, uh, well, some, some of my family is, is, is from there the fertile crescent yeah the the, the fertile crescent my 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 yeah uh, I, I saw like i'm bragging about my heritage now it's like my roots are pure and old um <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a pure blood people that's what i'm saying but um yeah but i so, so i've been to cyprus quite a bit and i've been to quite rural areas of cyprus as mm-hmm. a result and yeah like just the, the detail with which it's yeah, I, I remember being quite scared by it as a child, actually, just the detail with which you could see the stars and the Milky Way and stuff. It's just amazing, and you, you can't really get that in a lot of places. I mean, I imagine it's in the Scottish Highlands, where it's quite sparsely populated. Well, here in Manchester, you, you probably... see about 20, 30 stars up in the night sky on any given yeah. time. I, mean, I, I suppose the other problem is, is our weather, because it's cloudy a lot as well. Mm-hmm. So even if you are in a sparsely populated place, you're probably still not going to be able to see very much, whereas you know, in Cyprus, clear skies a lot more often, especially in the summer. So, yeah, just being able to look up and see all of that in, in a rural area is just yeah it's awe inspiring uh, yeah so they'd have been able to see 
comets and, and stuff coming in with relative ease. So they made there was this result. carving yeah. of a comet. This would suggest that the the site or parts of the site are much older because this happened thousands of years before before they, they, they thought Quebec Tepe was being built. So yeah, when you were talking about it being about fifteen thousand years old, I mean mm-hmm. this is just about thirteen thousand years old. Yeah. But yeah, so there there is a big window of well actually some evidence suggests it could be this old, some evidence yeah. suggests it could be younger or older. So yeah, but I mean it's again it's it's a mystery. No, nobody really knows. It's They've got a lots real of animals anomaly. on the wall. Lots of animals on the wall. Yes, lots comets. of animals, all kinds of creatures. And the details amazing as well. I don't know how many of the carvings you've looked at. I have, I've seen I've seen one. So I'm a big fan of a band called um, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Yes, and uh, they've got lots of drawings of uh, like cartoony drawings of crocodiles and alligators. And there's lots of <laughs> pictures of crocodiles. An alligator or alligators or some form of ancient dinosaur style reptile. It's one or the other, basically, uh, which just looks like that. Looks like their little like cartoon drawing just carved out. It's really detailed. It's fascinating that some of them are very detailed carvings and some of them are not so detailed. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, it suggests multiple artists, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Really, that's 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 the thing. So yeah. So let's let's get on to to theories. theories. Uh, so one of the um, really weird things about Gebekli Tepe is that it was probably deliberately buried. The reason this is thought to be the case is because there's a lot of sediment on top of the, the hill, which was uh, obscuring it okay. from 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 looking. You know, it made, made it look like a hill rather than uh, a structure. And sediment does not naturally form on hilltops. Mm-hmm. Um, hilltops are sites of erosion, not of yeah. Um, sediment not, forms yeah, at the yeah. bottom of hills. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so the chances of that having formed naturally are really, really unlikely. So it's thought that uh, by around 8,000 BC, it was it had been, Quebec Tepe had been deliberately buried. Interesting. And nobody knows why. Danielle Storer, uh-huh. the uh, the French archaeologist, she, uh, like I said, she believes that it's a, a sort of a, a funereal site and has connections to the, the afterlife. Klaus Schmidt, he... Uh, more or less concurs with that and thinks that bodies may be buried like in the base of the of the hill uh, uh, as it's the ideal location for the souls of of hunters because the, the, the hill is quite tall you can look out see all the game for mm-hmm. for miles and miles um and so you know the 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 hunters being buried in game the hill, reserve it's, yeah yeah it's, a, a, a pre, pre what neolithic game mm-hmm. reserve but obviously as you were saying the thing with the the, the worshiping of skulls and the decapitations mm-hmm. that it might have been some sort of death cult mm-hmm. as well and that they were actually worshiping death. Well, humans are a death cult we're killing we're killing the planet we're killing ourselves mm. um but like it's it's fascinating to me that like um you know the idea that like they could have had this site because like one of the things that i found interesting in the small things that I read about it was that um, it would have been like quite dark because they think that most of the area was actually roofed off. So they think that actually the site was actually quite a dark place where you couldn't see properly. And I yeah. find that fascinating. Like, so it's like, what were they doing in these like huts that they built with pillars and stuff? But one of the reasons it might have been deliberately buried is because a, a new religion had come along and it was just, you know, as, as new religions do, they, they want to get rid of the old religions. So, you know, new Religion might have come along. Damn just you, gone. Christianity is before Christianity. Yes, yeah, way before Christianity. <laughs> so um, you know, new new religious thinking might have come along, and these people spreading the new religion might have been like, "Well, let's get rid of that because mm-hmm. that's uh, it's uh, it's uh, blas- blasphemous." Well, blasphemous, blasphemous. <laughs> Blas- yeah, I don't know why. Christianity is very interesting because what Christianity usually does, which other religions generally don't, is Christianity usually absorbs aspects of the mm. local religion into itself so that it can sell religion to the yeah that's why you get the, well, i suppose uh, that's why it's become so popular yeah well that's why you get the um clover in in ireland oh yeah because it's the uh the father son and the holy ghost yeah so yeah it's the, the trinity, the holy trinity it's three, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, thinking yeah, they could that, explain yeah. that to people and that's, and what's, also that's, what's, that's what st patrick used to explain yeah yeah, yeah. and it's also to do with like obviously they were sort of druids and stuff at the time so they had like you know those very celtic sort of religious so if you go off nature and sort of explain things in a natural way that's basically how christianity sneaks its way in Mm. so uh i could imagine that that would be the stuff and then after a while you go well that's bad stuff so when saint patrick drove uh the snakes out of ireland he was obviously driving the druids and the other religions out of ireland that's what he was doing so Yeah. yeah religions do generally like to push one another aside don't they yeah indeed yeah 
Um, another idea is that it might have been desanctified for Bekle Tepe. So this is a, um, a religious thing that, that, that you have in quite a lot of religions. Mm-hmm. Like I think with, with that, um, old abandoned churches and stuff like that, they have to desanctify the altar so that people don't come in and just like use it for something else mm-hmm. uh, and incur the wrath of God as a result. So I'm not sure what the process is in the in 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 the church to do this, but um, yeah, the the idea that it was buried might have been because it um, yeah they they didn't want people angering these old gods with by by doing by by using them in a way that would not have pleased the the, the gods that they were worshiping, and so they they buried it to stop that like from using happening. It like a latrine or a table to eat a meal from. Well, yeah, quite yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another possibility that it was feared, like you know people. The people who built it would have been long dead by the time it was buried, and you know these huge stone structures. They were kind of unique in the world. It might have been people just looked at them and just was like, "It's wrong. It's just, it's just wrong with stretching too high. We're trying to be like the gods," and so mm-hmm. they buried it for that reason. Um, it's also so been like theorized the, that the Tower of Babel basically is. A... Yeah. Okay. There's also uh, like there's also a theory that it might have been part of the original ritual idea that it was always meant to be buried, like it was a structure that was made to be in the open for a certain number of years and then and then buried and you know this was just passed down word to mouth mm-hmm. through, through the generations and the, the reasons for that have been since lost but have you have you come across any interesting theories uh, oh actually but b- before you do i looked up um there, there was a, a, a wordpress page called uh, the tepe telegrams which is made I, by I read made that, by yeah, yeah made, made by researchers and there was like an faq section and mm-hmm. <laughs> i loved it the, the last the last question on the faq was was Quebecly tepe made by aliens and they've just put no <laughs> well it's it's interesting like. because the uh, alignment to the heavens is is fascinating so Quebecly tepe Faces true north, so it's built to true north. All right. It's also aligned with the dog star, which is fasc- serious. Serious, serious, which is fascinating because when at the time that it was built and it's in exact alignment with the dog star, at the time it was built, the dog star wasn't even visible. Oh, why not? Was it, it was on the other side of the on the other planet. side? Of, yeah, it was. Yeah, it's like it right. wasn't it, the way the orbit of the Earth and stuff like that. It wasn't, you know. Okay. So it's really fascinating. It um, it, you know, why is it? Why is it a? How do they manage? How do these hunter gatherers manage to get to point true north? It's aligned with the heavens. It, uh, I think I've even written down because it was fascinating. Mm. I mean, I, I've, I've, um, when I was doing my research, I did come across something suggesting that it might be, that yeah, the the depictions of animals might be relating to um, constellations in the same way as the zodiac. So you've got the scorpion, you've got, uh, yeah, I don't know, is there a goat? There might be a goat. So yes, uh, the. The, the dog star was not visible until 9,300 BC, but as I said, it might be coincidence, but Gobekli Te- Tepe in the way that it's been built uh, aligns with the dog star, which is mm. fascinating. So, well, it, if, if it was built in 9,000 BC though, then then they would have been able to see it. That's the uh... no, 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 no. That's when that's when yeah, but like obviously there's theories that it was born. It that was it was built, built yeah. So I mean, yeah, they, BC they yeah they, they they couldn't have both seen the the comet impact and. Serious in yeah. the sky, but that that in and of itself. So they say that it, it's not to do with aliens, but um, obviously. Well, I mean, it, it clearly, it, I I think I think the thing with Quebec to Tepe, unlike with some some other structures, it, it's it, it's not how the structure was built. Mm-hmm. Um, that was certainly in the capabilities of the people of the time. It's 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 more how were that many people able to be organized when they didn't have uh, an agricultural society and immediate access to water, to water as well. Like yeah, um, there's lots of mysteries. I mean, the the strangest thing. To me, the strangest thing about um, Gobekli Tepe is that the architecture gets worse the older it is. So with every single thing in human history, generally speaking, except for when you enter Dark Ages, the architecture gets better and there's an improvement on the previous generation. Gobekli Tepe is one of the few examples of somewhere where the artistry and the uh, the actual like craftsmanship in the earliest layers of the site are better than the later layers. So there's a theory which is um, made popular by Graham Hancock, who is a very yeah. left field archaeologist. He's not a qualified archaeologist, but he's a very left field individual. And he did speak to Klaus uh, Schmidt. Schmidt, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that like he believes that there's a lost civilization like Atlantis and things like that. Yeah. And he believes that that comet that we've been talking about, he believes that that was wiped them out, wiped out this ancient civilization. And so his theory is that what happened was people from this previous civilization 
came to Gobekli Tepe and they taught the hunter gatherers how to do certain craftsmanship and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's I think I think my my problem with that Graham Hancock theory anyway is kind of the same problem I have with the 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 ancient aliens things. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of a, a reverse human exceptionalism. Uh, and I think there is like a note of, of racism within that as well, where people will look at like what happened in ancient Egypt and or Mesopotamia, Sumeria, mm-hmm. or around Gebekli Tepe and go, well, you know, that couldn't have come from the, the local people couldn't have been that intelligent to have done that. It has to have been uh, a more advanced civilization from elsewhere, whether elsewhere on Earth or from a different planet. So I'm not, so I think I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not necessarily suggesting that people couldn't do that. I just think it's an interesting yeah. theory because he he groups up with a guy called Randall Carson or Randall Carson looks at geology and he's looked and he said, look, there's loads of evidence of around the same time as that comet hit as a worldwide cataclysm, which caused flooding as we've already discussed yeah. and things like that. Cause this period of time was really very different. Like you said, there was like ice sheets. It's not like literally like the fertile crescent is one of the few places on the planet where you could actually settle and like live quite a comfortable, happy life. Mm. Um, but we've just, the reason I like this as a theory I'm not saying that it's human exceptions. I'm not saying that humans aren't... We've discussed, like, 50,000 years ago, the first humans arrived, and they're pretty much the same as we are today. But yeah. on, the, on the flip side of that, it's also for me that, like, I find it very odd. I'm getting passionate about this story, Matthew. But I find it really odd that, like, in, like, 50,000 years' worth of human history, where they are as intelligent as we are today, that, like, we've only just in the last, like, 5,000 years started to get our shit together you know it just it just seems hmm. it, to me that seems that it's like oh well we we're, we're the best of course we're the best it's like no 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 like what the hell were humans doing for 50,000 years you know i mean i know that the the geology and and the actual environment has changed somewhat but at the same time like we can figure stuff out Hum- babies can figure stuff out you know they can they, yeah. humans have a yeah okay so so there is there is a theory that that might help to explain that which okay. i'm going to talk about in a moment but do you want to talk about the gopher man Go, well yeah so it goes along with this thank you uh, cuz yeah. um avi gopher avi gopher avi gopher who uh <laughs> i've just called him the gopher man the gopher, that, that, yeah. i i realize how racist that sounds avi gopher I'm, the gopher really, man i apologize to mr gopher he's from um He's from Tel Aviv University, and they did studies on it, and they found that um, Gobekli Tepe was built along grand geometric plan. So it's like geometrically sort of built, which is, you know, again, for hunter-gatherers, yeah, it quite. shows a level of skill and craftsmanship. And they say this about, but then again, they say this about Egypt. They're like, well, you couldn't build the pyramids because the pyramids face true north, and people of that age without the tools we've got today couldn't, hmm. like, because there were flint tools so they did dig they weren't using pneumatic drills and they weren't yeah. using metals and stuff like that they did sort of dig these rocks out of the ground with stone tools so it, it yeah. that is an impressive feat that i wouldn't want to take away from anybody but graham right. hancock says well maybe the previous civilization had um had a different idea of what civilized was than we do it's like well maybe they did he he says so graham hancock says well you know they uh you know, they might not like the the written tradition. They might not have liked the written tradition. They might have preferred um, they might have preferred like word of mouth and the oral tradition. But the thing about that as well is that if you think about our civilization today, everything's on computer. So this thing's yeah. going to last, not going to last. It's going to break down and, and and die. Right. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Whereas stone, that's what you yeah. want to write stuff I mean, down on. I mean, wanna... Tepe has been there for at least eleven thousand years. Yeah. yeah. It's and it's you know it's it's still there. It's, much, much in the same way as it was when it was built. And so, uh, I just want to show you this. I, yeah. I, so this is the, geomet- the geometric design. This is the picture they came up with. It just looks like a stick. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does actually. Yeah. <laughs> so it looks like three stick men having a dance, and um, and that's but but that was literally eight months ago that they've sort of found they've sort of done a, a geological survey of it or whatever kind of survey they do, and it it just seems very odd that the megaliths are set up that way. Uh, now. A guy called Michael Sherman had a discussion with Graham Hancock and, and Randall Carson on the Joe Rogan podcast, and uh, he was basically sort of saying, "Well, I, I think you guys are just wishful thinking, which might be the case." Mm. Uh, the problem with that is that I had to switch off that podcast because uh, Joe Rogan, who I, lo- I love dearly, but Joe Rogan was getting very passionate about it, like I was, and he was shouting um, Michael Sherman down. He's normally a very good interviewer, but uh, on that occasion, he was just like, "No, but aliens and past civilizations." Like Joe, dial it back. A bit. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, I, you know, I think it's fascinating. I think it was a hipster restaurant. <laughs> I think, I, th- I think it's well, like. It could have been. I think those stone carvings on the walls were uh, were actually well, like, um, like the cartoons of Ronald McDonald you get today. Yeah, they're sort of. It's not quite like that. It's more like this is the menu. So <laughs> right. If you want a crocodile steak, oh, there's crocodile spider. steak. You want to? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you've never been to Thailand, have you? No. I love Thailand. So in uh, in Bangkok, right? They've got these little old ladies that walk around with carts, and on the carts they've got like. They've got scorpions on like sticks, like the yeah. scorpion lollipops, effectively. And you've got these like big burly westerners walking around, going, oi, oi, oi. and these little old ladies go, would you, "Would you like to eat this?" And they're like, "Oh, I don't want to eat that." It's like it makes you a man, makes you strong. So they're like, "Okay, then I'm, I'm strong. Yeah, I'm strong. I'll eat that." And I was last time I was there, I was hanging out with some locals, and I was like, "Do you guys eat that shit?" And like, no. nah, we just feed it to you because we can make a mint off of it, and it's hilarious to watch you like pulling weird yeah. faces while you're chewing on it. So I think maybe it was just a bravado, <laughs> sort of like all-you-can-eat 24-hour buffet. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> of crocodile steaks and lion burgers, you know. <laughs> okay, well, uh, to, sort of, to sort of bring us round to, to the end of the episode, I'd like to talk about the, the Genesis Secret. Okay. So the Genesis Secret is a, a, a book written by, uh, it's a fiction book, written by a man called Tom Knox, um, published in 2009. Okay. Uh, and it is based uh around well there's kind of two s- storylines that intersect uh in the in the kind of the, the third act of the book mm-hmm. so there's um there's a storyline based on this journalist who is like he'd, he'd been reporting on conflicts in the middle east and had been injured in a bomb blast okay uh, and so to give him an easier get back into work kind of thing they sent him off to review uh to, to just like to sort of do a piece on a kind of a fluff piece on Gobekli Tepe. Okay. Uh, and the other half of the book is this, uh, follows this police officer, uh, this detective who's trying to solve these really bizarre ritualistic murders that are taking place uh, across the, the UK. Basically, this 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 book, it, it ends with, uh, like, it's not a particularly well-known book, so I will sort of spoil parts of it in terms of that the, there is a theory as to what Gobekli Tepe was. The cat just sneezed. Yeah, I know the cat. The, the cat. The cat's in here now, and the cat just sneezed. Um, but so uh, yeah, so this is it's, it's basically the the Garden of Eden theory. Okay. Now, uh, uh, Gebekli Tepe researchers hate this. Like they, they, I don't know if they hate the book, but they they really don't like the the idea that Gebekli Tepe was the, the the Garden of Eden on that te- Tepe telegrams. They say it's pure conjecture. It's pure conjecture. So they're not happy with that. Also, interestingly, Klaus Schmidt and Daniel... So what, what was the theory, though? That I mean, like, how does the theory actually play out? Well, I, I'm going to tell you in a okay. moment. Uh, I, I just want to say that Klaus Schmidt and Daniel Storer, two of the archaeologists I was talking about before, okay. they're both in this book. Um, they, they have different names. Klaus Schmidt. Klaus, Klaus Schmidt, he died in, in 2014. I think he suffered a heart attack or something. He but, did, yeah. Uh, his, 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 his character in the book, uh, he gets murdered at one point. And, uh, and Jesus. Dan- Danielle Storer. Who's is is like this the, why they don't like the book? It's prob- probably, probably. You just prob- murdered my character. You just <laughs> murdered me in a book. Pro- like. Probably, yeah. Um, Dan- Danielle Storer ends up becoming the, the love interest as well. So. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah, yeah no, what the, like, good God. <laughs> um, I can't remember what the characters' names are in the book, but uh, I think I think the the German archaeologist is called Franz Breitner. Uh, something Franz like Breitner. The, yeah, rather than Klaus Schmidt. And I, I can't remember what the... What the? It's, she's in most of the book as well. I can't remember what her name is in in, in the book, but it's, it's not Danielle Storer anyway. Well, what, but, was uh, the, what was the um? What was the? What was the character called in? What was the doctor called in um, Moonraker? Like it's like something ridiculous, like Doctor Kiss My Lips or something. Yeah. Like, you know, like so, like, I think that's probably. Oh well, like, there's um, in 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 Goldeneye. There's Zenia on a top, isn't yeah. there? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm guessing that's kind of the level that we're like going with here. Like yeah. Professor Sexy Pants, <laughs> what, what have you found? <laughs> I believe this is where Adam and Eve were. Okay, so uh, Tom Knox's th- theory, the, the Garden of Eden theory, okay. is, is, is due to the abundance of the, of the Fertile Crescent, mm-hmm. which was you know, the area Gobekli Tepe was in, uh, and this was the truth behind the allegory of the Garden of, of Eden in the Bible. Right. There was loads of stuff that, that just grew, loads of animals roaming free. You didn't mm-hmm. need to farm, really. You could live a very comfortable and happy life. Just taking what you needed from the land. Going However, for a stroll with a spear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. However, due to the the ice age and all the, all the problems precipitated by the comet, mm-hmm. bigger bigger people, uh, bigger bigger species of humans came down from from the cold north where they couldn't survive. Yes, that's right. It's the our giants. old pal Gigantopithecus from oh. the Atlov Pass episode. He's back. <laughs> he was doing things 
thousands of years ago. He's still doing things today. Fee, Screwing fi, fo, fo. It's Gigantopithecus. So the, the, the theory is that Gigantopithecus then uh, forced humans into essentially slavery. And this is what created agri- agriculture because um, agriculture is not actually comfortable for, for, for human beings as a shift from a very plentiful hunter-gatherer existence mm-hmm. because it means uh, poorer conditions, a lot more work and a lot more damage done to the bodies of the people who do the farming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, so Tom Knox thinks that this, this might be why uh, was that Gigantopithecus forced humanity into doing it because they were bigger and stronger. And this could also explain how the temple was built, that, you know, the Gigantopithecus now living off, off the labour of others just went, build me a temple. Uh, and, and that's what that was about. His theory is then that after after centuries of this happening, the land became less fertile because of the excessive farming dominant resulting of giants. <laughs> yeah, well, it, re- resulting in a war between the 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 humans and Gigantopithecus, which the humans won because um, there were more of them and they had tools well, um, that they were more effective. That, that, th- that, you know, basically by being forced into doing all of this stuff, they created better tools. I mean, that's quite and, interesting. Yeah, and then they created weapons, which they were then able to beat Gig- yeah. Gigantopithecus with. Because th- that's quite interesting, because when you think about it, like uh, like the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, that's mm. essentially, when you look at what that story is about, is about a little man who, it, the populace of this village are poor, they don't have a lot of money, they've not got a lot of things, and there is a giant who uh, lives somewhere that's hard to reach, which has uh, which has all the wealth and all the things, and it's about the little man going and sort of like stopping him. So like obviously fairy tales and stuff like that come from real life, oftentimes or cautionary tales. So like yeah, like I wonder if that's maybe something like that, or maybe this guy's just likes that. <laughs> <nursery> <laughs> <story>. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. I, yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but that that is a, that is a good comparison. The the other thing is so that that might be the the purpose of Gebekli Tepe and what happened. Why mm-hmm. why was it then buried? So Tom Knox's theory about that was that there there had been interbreeding uh, between the humans and and Gigantopithecus, more specifically the Gigantopithecan males and the human females. That sounds painful. Um, which and this might be part of the uh, the Yazidi faith. Remember, I was talking about the Yazidi. So, what is the Yazidi faith? Because right, fascinated. so the Yazid, they're they're kind of considered to be devil worshippers, but okay. they're not really. They they worship this kind of weird bird like man thing, which similar to. Um, drawings are actually on the stones at Quebec Tepe. Does he look like uh, Bazuzu from um, The Omen? I guess the, o- the start of The Omen's... No, the start of The Omen can't be based on this. But yeah, it, so the, in Bazuzu's like a, a demon from Samaria, essentially. Oh. And uh, yeah, that's... I, the, that's it's, the, it's, it's been a long time since I've watched The Omen. I can't remember what, what he looks like. But. Okay, yeah. Well, is it, so Bazuzu's this big bird creature demon thing. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's called Melek Taus anyway. Melek but, Taus. Uh, and it's a kind of like, yeah, sort of like bird-human kind of hybrid looking looking thing. Tom Knox's theory is that this was actually what a Gigantopithecus looked like. And so that's what they're... <laughs> big, <laughs> so birds, they're big bird, bird, uh, and bird so, oppressed the human so race. Like the, <laughs> the, the Yazidis have... A similar, so a lot of religions have a thing about like purity and impurity. Okay. Uh, and so like there was like a number of jars or something and there were impure children, but the Yazidis are descended from pure children of something. So the Yazidis might be descended from the the more, uh, like the the true untainted descendants of, of true humans rather than the uh, human uh, Gigantopithecus hybrids, which is everyone else. I'm never going to look at Big Bird in the same way ever yeah. again. <laughs> Uh, so f- for this reason, Gebekli Tepe might have been deliberately buried to hide the the shame of the slavery and uh, protect the anonymity of people who were children who were hybrids of Gigantopithecus and humans. So although uh, although and so the going back to the Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. it's like you know the, the thing that Eve is responsible for all evil because she she accepts the she listens to the apple, snake or yeah, yeah whatever has the apple and that might actually knowledge. um be a symbolic representation of uh, a human mother of a Gigantopithecan child. And so it was, yeah, women are being blamed for just like, oh, she slept with him and now we've got all these hybrids. So that might be the whole, the allegory of the Garden of Eden and getting thrown out of the Garden of Eden was because of um, crossbreeding. I mean, obviously there are, so one of the issues with that idea would be that you would expect to find bird people or strange animals. Hello, Mr. Cat, do you want to go out? 
Yeah, the, the, it's Mrs. Cat. That's Mrs. It. Cat. Uh, supposed to go. I mean, we're, we're nearly finished. We are think, nearly finished. I think, Kat, I think she does want to go out. If you come here for a minute, we'll just we'll wrap up. I'll yeah. I'll I'll give some spiel about how if you were going to be finding stuff, you'd be, you'd, you'd literally if you were digging up an archaeological site and there had been a different form of human, you would expect to find well, well, that, some of those deceased That is Tom Mox's theory, is that that's what they're going to find at the base of Quebec du Tape. And it's still, yeah, so it's still not uncovered yet. Because you wouldn't, because you wouldn't, if, if, if you were going to bury these things mm-hmm. thinking that, that, you know, the truth would never get out, you wouldn't just like lie them all around the sides of the thing. You'd, you'd put them in the deepest, darkest place of Quebec du Tape then cover the whole thing over with, with rock and sand. Yeah, I mean, true. But, and there's still a lot to be discovered to be honest with you, like twenty, you know, twenty six years is not, a, or twenty seven years nearly is not a long time in the grand scheme of things mm. to uncover a new sort Quite. of thing. So you could be right. Yeah, so, and and like I said, because of the the, the, the seasons and yeah, the, the long time it takes, and because they want to be really careful as well, so they don't destroy any evidence when mm. they find it. Like this, it's 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 a big site and it's hugely important. So everything they're doing is like is they are doing it incrementally so that they don't destroy anything because this could be, you know, a massive a, a massive clue to part of our history that has obviously never been recorded and that we don't know that much about. So, yeah, this th- this could go on past the end of our lives, the yeah. ex- I mean, excavation it's, of Quebec. It's quite happened. interesting because I've never really thought about um, the Garden of Eden in sort of the terms that we're talking about. So the idea that the Garden of Eden was... It's uh, an allegory. Well, yeah, but it's not just that. It's the fact that, like, you could say that the Garden of Eden was, like humans just living off the land so just like you know mm. killing a gazelle because there was herds of gazelles at the time just you know walking around and living a nomadic life living in the trees and then the idea that they say eve gave humans knowledge but the idea that knowledge then made us agrarian and mm. changes and causes a lot of stress and hardship in some ways i mean yes our lives improved and our age got longer but with that you know the idea that we got uh, consciousness to a degree some sort of yeah. knowledge of our own mortality which you wouldn't have had prior to that well i mean they they would have had that prior to that they they, they would have had a knowledge of of, of their own mortality because it's just like you said like you know, they, they had the capacity for the same intelligence yeah, it's before, it's not way before it's not a very good an- analogy but it's um, just interesting i've just not really thought yeah, about well i think it's yeah i i i guess the thing is is that like obviously agriculture oh poor cats really unhappy um so so, um with 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 agriculture and and and, and society these these things benefit us now because they make our lives much easier now at the time for the people who did the first people who did that Mm -hmm. would never have seen the benefits of that um it was just harder work for them and these things have been built up over time Mm -hmm. so it's why would they choose to go through that even if they knew it would make things better you know hundreds thousands of years in the future why would they choose to go through that then? And that that is a question that maybe something in Gebekli Tepe will answer. Uh, that's Tom Knox's theory. So, what's, what's uh, and your think, favorite? What's your favorite idea? What's your out of all the ones that we've discussed? What is your favorite idea? Uh, well, that 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 one is my favorite idea. I don't think all parts of it are, are true. It, 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 it maybe that no, no parts of it are true. I, if, if that's I think about that theory, I think it's it it, it answers too much and i think there's probably things about that theory that that could, will only be explained with more discoveries made at the site mm-hmm. so i think having this all encompassing theory that explains everything at the moment is a little too simplistic but i i do really like that that theory of that that yeah it's just a marker from of the transition from from hunter gatherers mm-hmm. in, in a time of plenty to agriculture and the uh yeah, like like you say, with the the greater amount of knowledge, like the difficulties mm-hmm. that that causes, whether whether it's gigant, Gigantopithecus enslaving people or not, or if it was just humans saying, "Well, I'm the biggest, strongest human, so I'm going to make you do the work for well, me." Well, this is it. So, the, like <clears> to, <throat> to build Gobekli Tepe, you'd have needed a hierarchy. So that's a, quite, so yeah. you'd need a hierarchical structure. But also, the pro- one of the problems with the site is there's no evidence of yeah. a hierarchical society. So, like, well, you need. For any building project, for, you need a project manager. A project yeah. manager is always going to be above the labourers right, yeah. on any construction. Otherwise, everyone would just be putting stones wherever they want to. Yeah, exactly. You, so you've got like you a You need mate, to coordinate. Because this would have taken hundreds of people. That's the other thing. So if you're living like a nomadic... Meow. Sorry, the cat's still going. But you need, if if to build something like that, if you're living a nomadic life, how do hundreds of people come together to do that? Uh, mm. it's, 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 a really, yeah. it's a really strange mystery. I personally... Yeah, what's your favourite? I favorite? personally think that... Um, 
I go with the idea that there was a lost civilization. I think that is, to my mind, from everything that I know from reading about it, I've not read the same stuff as you, but I think the idea of a, uh, a lost civilization does ring a bit more true because I think that humans have been around for much longer than we've had the technology and things we've had today. And when I say like an advanced civilization, I mean maybe something more like the Romans or something like that. It yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be, to be you know, they had running yeah. water and things like that, yeah. you know. Uh, but like the the idea that obviously the, with the change of the actual architecture getting less and the fact that um, with the sacking of Alexandria, when the library got burnt down, oh, yeah, yeah, we lost so much we literature. Lost, yeah. We literally only have about 1% of literature from ancient times. Yeah. So yeah. like it's, I, I, to my mind, especially with lockdown, I think our society is so much more fragile than we realize and our civilization is so much more fragile than we realize. And the fact that we don't, record things in a very permanent way we record things in the cloud everything's stored in the cloud which doesn't really exist yeah um so i <laughs> so the, so so all, all ancient information was stored in the cloud is it? yeah stored in the clouds where the gods are so ah, you know, well there we go it all it all it all comes down everything is connected but uh yeah uh, the possibilities are endless but this podcast is not so we must call it a day there. Because the cat really the cat, needs the cat's to really leave the room. Upset. She wants to leave the room. <laughs> we want to have our tea because the takeaway arrived while we were recording. So thanks very much for listening. We'll be back in two weeks when we talk about Billy Mitchell and the Donkey Kong controversy. The Donkey Kong controversy. Uh, yes, so what I will say to you folks is have a good Easter. Enjoy those eggs. And um, don't be scared of the bird, man. <laughs> or do be scared of the bird or do be scared of the, yeah fear big bird he's trying to, make you, he's trying to rope you into construction pro- yeah. projects <laughs> I'm there yeah I, I might see if there's anything else that, that we can do any other episodes because I just like saying Gigantopithecus it's, it's very pleasing I've got it in twice in this season uh, how many more times will I get it in we don't know that's the real mystery folks join us next time on YRY to find out bye 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 bye